Thanks, Anubhav. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see my yeah. cursor? We can see it, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'll start with a brief, uh, you know, recap of yesterday so that, you know, uh, if somebody didn't attend, they won't get fully lost. And also, it helps to recap in any case. So, uh, we were talking about different kinds of bifurcations which happen in flows and take the flow towards turbulence. And we uh, also discussed that transition to turbulence is a most complicated process. And, you know, it could, the primary thing itself which happens could be a supercritical hop for a subcritical pitchfork. It could be a whole variety of instabilities that start the whole process and then like very complicated, more and more nonlinear things can happen before the flow goes to fully turbulent. So the two things we talked about were boundary layers where Tolmin Schlichting waves, the traditional waves which are spanwise independent occur and uh, the more uh, recent subcritical, it's not so recent now, it's been going on for three or four decades at this point, but um, uh, it's more recent than that. Um, subcritical routes to transition where you often find the uh, streamwise independent structures which uh, can be uh, thought of as streaks or vortices as we'll come to in greater detail today and in channel flow for example you can get this instability at a much lower Reynolds number than the first exponential growth mode. We uh, discussed how you know things in stability can be very counterintuitive so here is a density stratification which is stable here's a st shear stratification a jump in shear which is also stable you put them both together you get an instability so whenever there's shear there's lots of interesting things that happen so one thing i want you to take away from these two lectures even if you don't remember anything else that uh, was talked about is that you know shear Shear can, you know, amuse you, it can surprise you, it will do very strange things which will be totally counterintuitive, like it can shock you and it makes the problem so much harder that you can sometimes get super frustrated with it. It can do a whole variety of things, but it will never bore you. So that's important, like every time there's shear, there's fun or it keeps us in, you know, a career. So we also discussed the Rayleigh-Fjotov theorems for inviscid instability. So we looked at how, you know, a profile like this, which is parabolic, uh, cannot go unstable inviscidly because the U double prime never crosses an inflection point. And we considered an inflection point as a necessary condition for instability. Uh, but we saw how viscosity acts and, you know, Howard semicircle theorem assures us that u equal to c somewhere in the flow where c is omega by alpha the phase speed of the disturbance so because of this you're assured of critical layers happening in the flow and because there are critical layers which are very thin like their reynolds to the minus some power where reynolds is very big they're reasonably thin layers in which a lot of action happens and in these layers you cannot neglect viscosity and because you cannot neglect viscosity, like viscosity can actually pump in instabilities and uh, it can violate the inviscid conditions. I mean, it's not a violation because it's now viscous. So like viscosity can create the, I mean, do the production as well as the dissipation. And here is the production in production and dissipation shown in a channel where you see this is the critical point U equal to C and this is about the thickness of the critical layer. So you see that all the disturbance energy production is in the critical layer and it's dissipated near the wall. Now, um, we then stopped yesterday's discussion by starting the discussion on, you know, uh, these um, subcritical situations where both laminar and turbulent have a basin of attraction and the two basins and that was like, you know, in some range of Reynolds numbers. The basins of attraction were separated by this, you know, uh, basin boundary and this basin boundary is like a maximum in the uh, finite time Lyapunov exponent. It's basically a ridge. So then like uh, 
from this boundary uh, nothing can cross so everything depends on the initial condition so if you started an initial condition here you go towards turbulent you start it here you go towards laminar and you could go through a very convoluted path but you will always stay on this side of the basin boundary and this was the basic concept so depending on the initial condition you can be on this side or that side and uh, to think of what the initial condition would be like you have to take the whole flow the channel take x y z and at every point the u v and w so that entire thing would constitute like one point on this uh, plot one point in a basin of attraction and that would determine where you go further on so that was the basic idea of this basin boundary and uh, we discussed that uh, one of the very important games that uh, uh, are there in this um, field is to understand what is the minimal seed that means what is the smallest distance you can go away from the laminar situation and actually be on the turbulent side of the basin boundary so what is the smallest thing you can do to push something to turbulence and uh, now the thing is given that the whole system was non normal we discussed these uh, stability linear stability equations about the laminar flow yesterday and we said that this expression makes this matrix very non normal incidentally each of these los for example the or sommerfeld operator is non normal in itself so now uh, what happens is that uh, it's because of this non normality this basin boundary can come actually very very close way closer than you realize in some particular directions in some very large dimensional space so like some small set of initial conditions it could even be a larger set of initial conditions take you away from laminar and towards turbulent and as the reynolds number keeps increasing this basin boundary basically closes in on the laminar case and you can do the smallest possible thing and you would be on the turbulent side of the basin so basin boundary so this uh, can be uh, thought of as what reynolds number does there are these saddle points called edge states on these basin boundaries these basin boundaries actually form stable manifolds so like if you start exactly on the boundary at a point here you would keep following this following this following this and you will be on the stable end of a saddle point so the same with this side so and you know that in a in a stable situation you're going to approach this point namely the edge state at infinite time technically you will take infinite time to reach this place and then rush off into one of the basin boundary one of the basins so but most of the time obviously you're going to start a very small distance away from the manifold and while you will spend a lot of time on the manifold follow it follow it follow it you'll finally reach a situation very close to the edge state after which you'll race off very fast like on this unstable manifold so here you're going to do slow dynamics and here you're going to do fast dynamics so that is uh, something else which the uh, basin of attraction buys you okay so like we discussed here that this non normality of the operator brings in a lot of this interesting stuff otherwise you would get very simple basin boundaries which didn't have a particularly you know significant minimal seed sometimes it can be important for you to kick the whole thing into turbulence or at least understand what's going to kick it into turbulence so minimal seeds can become very important and edge states are also very important because they differentiate slow to fast dynamics they differentiate a lot of other things so these saddle points are very important for us to know and because it's coming out of the non normality let let us spend some time talking about the non normality itself so let's first start with a simple example non normal matrices non normal operators give what is called transient growth so they can go to instability even when all the eigen values are negative that means all the cis that we talked about yesterday are negative and so the flow is technically exponentially uh, killing off all disturbances but let's take this example of just two uh, simple uh, two differential equations or two odes in x1 and x2 
so you can immediately see that the eigenvalues are minus 1 and minus 0.5 so like uh, x1 is e to the power minus t x2 is e to the power minus something and minus something so like at time equal to infinity obviously these two are going to decay so this is a linearly stable uh, set of equations however if you tailor expand x2 so you see that x2 is equal to this plus t into this plus t square into that at very very small times i can take only the linear term in t and unless x2 zero is very big you can see that this can grow so you can see that there is algebraic growth at short times depending on your initial conditions certain initial conditions can grow and in in a huge dimensional system like uh, the navier stokes in like big reynolds number flows you can get many many uh, 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 opportunities for such growth and this growth can happen for a long time and it can be we can take your initial perturbation to very big uh, numbers very big amplitudes and which is why the whole thing can go into turbulence in other words sometimes even with a small initial thing you can be on the other side of the basin boundary so like another way of looking at it is a pictorial way and it's very instructive the basic point is whenever you have a non-normal system like this the eigenfunctions are not orthogonal to each other they are at some angle to each other so in the in a simple case like this we can easily draw the two eigenfunctions on a plane and yeah here is the canonical matrix which we can of which we considered some numbers in the previous one there's two negative eigenvalues and an off diagonal term depending on the size of this off diagonal term funny things can happen so here you see two uh, eigenvectors which are not orthogonal to each other and at uh, zero time they are the black and at some time they are the red so by the time uh, you reach the red both of them shrunk so this one became very small and this one became smaller than its initial however the resultant has grown compared to the resultant at time equal to zero so like suppose you think of x as some energy like u square plus v square so then the resultant would tell you the net energy right and you see that this thing which was this much has become that much so it can grow at short times this is the message and for a 2d system like this you i mean you can go and read this paper if you like you can actually pull out necessary conditions for uh, you know any amount of transient growth it won't grow just because it's non normal doesn't mean it will grow non normal is only a necessary condition you can pull out further conditions like how big should the off diagonal term be to see significant growth or to see any growth whatsoever and so on so now this is what happens to the uh, perturbation so like here i have added a non linear term to show what happens now when x is very 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 small this non linear term is very unimportant and you get the algebraic growth according to our uh, you know uh, analysis last time but by this time the amplitude has become big and then this bx cube could come into play and depending on what the bx cube does you could either come back here or you could go to a new state so instead of coming back to zero it's now going into a new state so like basically you can tie that up to your uh, to our discussion of the subcritical transition yesterday so imagine that there is this unstable manifold and two stable manifolds this stands for laminar and this stands for turbulent or lower branch upper branch let's call them this is the lower branch and this is the upper branch where there is some perturbation energy which it saturates to and here it comes back to zero so the point is depending on which side of this basin boundary you started so even sometimes the basin boundary can come so close to the laminar and you'll be starting from a small amplitude here and that could make the b bx cube term act and go to a new state so these are very typical behaviors you see in subcritical transition so how do we uh, apply this to our shear flow so like suppose we considered a two dimensional instability we would be only confined to the or sum of held operator this is already non normal as we will see when we discuss the or mechanism but it's considered a kind of feeble non normality whereas the lift up which comes due to this shear term which we'll also talk about this is a uh, 
this actually is so strong that you can come up with a self-sustaining mechanism for turbulence. So, take, I mean, normally people believe that you need 3D and it's normally true also, uh, except in special situations, that you need 3D to go to turbulence and uh, you need this mechanism in the subcritical regime. Uh, whereas the OR mechanism can like make perturbations grow for some time, but it's not going to be the cause of turbulence typically in all the simple systems we'll talk about today, but there are, con I mean, contradictions to that or other examples. Okay, so what is the OR mechanism? So like you, let's take Kuwait flow where just you have u prime du by dy is a constant. So u is just a plane shear in a Kuwait flow. This flow, you know that there are no unstable modes. If you did the or some of held on this, you would get no instability. And certainly if you did the inviscid one, you'll get no instability. There is no inflection point. But what happens to the energy? We saw that the production term looks something like this u prime times the perturbation velocity u times perturbation velocity v averaged out and integrated from you know one end of the channel to the other so the energy change like this is a nice way of putting it which Anubhav did and he made this uh, picture many years ago so uh, so so now what what you do is that you can write u and v in terms of the stream functions so u is del u by del psi by del y and v is known to be minus del psi by del x. So you can write this in this form and continue the average. Now I've just multiplied and divided by del psi by del y. And then I can throw away the stream function here to make this a dy by dx because everything is a continuous function of everything else. So I have every right to do this when there's no singularities and such things. So I rewrite this as dy by dx. And now this is a square quantity which can never be negative so if you want energy to grow there's a minus sign here and u prime is positive you need this to be negative so like if all the you know and these are lines of constant stream function so each color is like i mean each line here is a line of constant stream function you can see that if they're all tilted backwards then the dy by dx is negative for them and the shear is now you know positive here and zero here so the shear is going to turn these structures around so as it turns it around the energy will grow up to here and then the energy will start decaying so this is the or mechanism you can see that uh, uh, you can see that everything is very transient here most of these linear mechanisms where the flow is stable have to be transient so only up to time equal to t1 it can grow and it can grow only by a certain amount like you know that amount is dictated by how bent it is so there's a finite thing you can do finite amount of growth you can get from this picture and this is entirely two-dimensional that's to be remembered so like one uh, contradiction or counter example I can give you here is that when you have a plane channel instead of this if you had slightly divergent channel so Mamta um, Jotkar had done this work you could get like very 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 enormous growth by the OR mechanism just by you know changing the angle of the wall by like one or two degrees not too much you can get enormous growth and you know uh, complete instead breakdown by uh, uh, the OR mechanism Okay, so like uh, we discussed about uh, the OR mechanism, but like our basic point is to solve the entire general problem. So like we are, we are faced with the linearized uh, Navier-Stokes, which looks like this. Yesterday we looked at it in the or Sommerfeld case, like just to remind you, let's go quickly back there. Yeah, we uh, derived this equation where we uh, put the uh, time derivative as I, I alpha c times u like because we Fourier transformed in the time derivative uh, time also and today we are not Fourier transforming in time we are keeping the time derivative as it is and the rest of it is an operator the, this whole thing is the linearized operator except for the c term acting on the small uh, uh, small velocity v namely the perturbation velocity v in this case but we can write it in three dimensions as we did here. 
you can write it in three dimensions here. And I told you yesterday that we uh, write it in the, oops, we write it in the um, uh, normal wall, normal perturbation velocity and the wall normal perturbation vorticity. And this is a simple form in which you can write the entire linearized Navier-Stokes. And uh, we look for instabilities in that. Now, how are we supposed to solve that whole problem? So in the case here, uh, we could easily, you know, like solve it for different, different initial conditions and see which grows. We could do trial and error with a variety of initial conditions and see which one grows more and what is the maximum and stuff like that. We can even do it analytically in some cases. Um, whereas when you're talking about the Navier-Stokes, let's say in a channel flow, in Kuwait flow, in any of these things, the the kind of perturbations you can put are like technically infinite and you don't know which of these perturbations is going to grow so only those perturbations will grow which give you know uh, in that eigenvalue problem where we took this uh, u dot as a fourier transform in time only those perturbations can even exist where the dispersion relation namely the frequency to wave number relation is satisfied but even those which exist, even when you solve that linearized problem, you get like infinite number of modes which exist. So then like any linear combination of those modes can give any kind of transient growth. So which is the worst possible linear combination, namely the linear combination of all these eigenmodes. Remember, they are no longer orthogonal to each other in a big and dimensional space. Which of those is going to give you um the highest possible transient growth this is an important question to ask to know whether it, it's on the turbulent side or the lamina side what how bad can it get before it decays all kinds of questions can be answered only if you know the biggest growth or you might want to optimize for something else like you may say i don't care about you know how big the disturbance kinetic energy can grow to but let me worry about whether you know mixing of the sort Paul Linden was talking about can be maximized by this method. So like what, what if I just want to optimize mixing and I want to see what's the initial condition in terms of density, in terms of whatever, whatever, which will optimize the mixing. So like all of these optimization questions we can ask. There's a whole variety. We might want to maximize dissipation for some bizarre reason. We might, of course, want to minimize dissipation, which is like sending it back to lamina. We might want to do a whole variety of things with this. So now we are starting and, and so we have to talk about some general methods by which we can uh, solve these problems. So, um, so, so let's start with the linear example where u dot is a u and a could be that operator, the or sum of L square, whatever, whatever. I mean, this is just any uh, toy system we're going to talk about in this page, but it can stand for the Navier-Stokes. And in this particular case, we are saying we're going to add up the kinetic energy at every grid point, and we're going to uh, divide it by its initial value and see how much the kinetic energy gain is. So what is the biggest gain you can get in kinetic energy? That's the question we're going to ask right here. But you can uh, do change this model to your uh, heart's content and optimize anything you like. So if u dot is a u and a is a constant, it doesn't depend on the perturbation. It depends on the mean flow. So it's a function of space, but it, it's not a function of time. So like if I've discretized it in space, I get this enormous matrix let's say an m cross n or m cross n cross l matrix uh, i have this thing in space in all three directions uh, but like it's a linear system so i can immediately write down its solution and the solution is u of time equal to e to the at times u0 so that's of course like it's a matrix exponential i have to do that carefully so this is what it is so at any given time I can tell the ut by this, given a u0. But the point is we have to maximize it over all initial conditions. We're going to look for that unique initial condition which has the property that we want. And we want to know that initial condition everywhere in x, y, and z. So this is our point, right? So we know that any matrix of this form 
any matrix like any reasonable matrix can be written as a unitary matrix times a diagonal matrix times another unitary matrix so uh, and this thing i've written in its conjugate transpose uh, because we know that in a unitary matrix the conjugate transpose is also the inverse of that matrix but it's just convenient to write it in this form and not v so like uh, this uh, is a representation of e to the 80 remember this thing is going to change at every time because it's exponentially increasing with time if it's unstable and whatever so this this is a matrix that's going to be changing in time now what is ut the norm of ut square that's what we want to find right uh, and we know it's e to the this thing into u0 so i can write this thing into u0 times times its transpose where everything appears backwards this should have been a plain v sorry typo this should have been a plain v uh, so now you can see that because in a unitary matrix the conjugate transpose is the inverse you you, you inverse and you get cancelled and i get this reduced thing in the reduced thing if i have norm of this big thing i can write it's less than or equal to norm of this times norm of this times norm of this and now norm of this and this get cancelled with that so I'm left with the gain, which is basically the norm of this matrix. So now the interesting thing that you see here is that uh, sigma square is a diagonal matrix. So whenever you have a diagonal matrix, its norm is just its maximum growing eigenvalue. So like if you want to maximize the response of any vector to this. So whenever you talk about the norm of a matrix, you're talking about multiplying that matrix by um, some uh, vector, uh, no, uh, finding the norm of that thing because there's no matrix norm as such defined, finding the norm of that resulting vector and dividing by the uh, vector without uh, hitting it with A and the ratio of these is going to give you the norm when you maximize it over all those vectors. So that is the norm of a matrix. And for a diagonal matrix, you know that you can never ever grow at a faster rate than the maximum eigenvalue whatever it may be whether it's positive or negative the the norm is lambda one and uh, so we know this now about a diagonal matrix whereas our matrix e to the 80 was not diagonal it was not normal it was uh, by non-normal i meant it it times its conjugate transpose would not be equal to conjugate transpose times itself so because of that uh, and, and then we uh, we wrote it in this form and now this buys us something and this uh, so so now we're dealing with the diagonal matrix uh, so the gain is now given by this thing and we know that wherever and now the, v is a unitary matrix we know that and we know that when a diagonal matrix is hit with a unitary matrix on both sides its norm doesn't change because it's just hit with v and v inverse and its norm doesn't change so we have g equal to chi 1 the largest eigenvalue of sigma square is just the largest eigenvalue of sigma square in other words it's the largest eigenvalue of e to the 80 transpose times e to the 80 okay so uh, this chi 1 is not the eigenvalue of e to the 80 it's the singular value of the matrix e to the 80 which is the eigenvalue of the matrix sigma square so now we found the singular value which can give you the largest growth and the initial condition giving the largest growth is the first column of v so here i've assumed that you know chi 1 chi 2 are arranged in such a way that chi 1 is the biggest growing so v is the matrix of all eigenvectors as you can see here so like if you uh, say that you know um, some matrix b v uh, b uh, v equal to v sigma square you'll see that v is the matrix of the eigenvectors of sigma square and the first column of that will be the one corresponding to lambda one and in that direction everything is going to grow the maximum so is this clear or are there questions right now is it clear so far yeah okay okay so then there like you know there can be other alternatives ways than finding the svd and we'll soon see why that's needed so like we could do this thing called power iteration 
uh, rather than finding each eigenvalue painstakingly, you might sometimes gain a lot of computational time by, uh, just give me a minute. Yeah, you could gain a lot of computational time if under certain conditions uh, where let's say the largest eigenvalue is so much larger than everybody else. In that case, you can do a power iteration. You can always do a power iteration, but if the largest eigenvalue is much larger than everybody else, you get this extreme benefit that you're going to converge very, very quickly to the largest eigenvalue by this iteration process. So what I'm going to do here is, I take the matrix sigma square whose eigenvalues I don't know, and then I multiply it by some guess vector. And trusting that this guest vector has some component in the largest eigenvalue. I mean, in other words, I've not been unlucky to choose that particular eigenvectors, which is lying completely orthogonal to the one I'm looking for. So if I do this, this is actually like a few steps of algebra you can look up in Wikipedia or anywhere. And it's so beautiful how like you keep changing K. So at each K, you start with a guess. You multiply uh, that eigenvector by this matrix, pre-multiply by this matrix, divide by its norm. That gives you a new eigenvector. That new eigen, a new guess eigenvector that you plug back in here and so on and so on. And very, very quickly, it's going to converge to, uh, you know, the largest eigenvalue. It's going to very quickly converge you to the largest eigenvalue and eigenvector. So the exact same thing we're going to do by, um, uh, doing direct adjoint looping. So what is direct adjoint looping? We keep hearing this term. It's nothing but a power iteration, but the power iteration is formed over an operator, not a matrix. So like now we have the Navier-Stokes as an operator acting on the initial condition or the linearized Navier-Stokes or any complicated set of equations. Whatever it is, you can do this thing to get the optimal growth. So like uh, uh, if, if you're doing linearized Navier-Stokes, you can do SVD. Uh, you can uh, derive an SVD formulation for that, where SVD is singular value decomposition that we talked about in this slide. Uh, but if it's not linear or for some reason you cannot, you know, uh, you cannot compute e to the 80 so easily. There can be so many reasons why, you know, this thing doesn't work. When that happens, you can do this thing called direct adjoint looping. Now, this thing is an operation where you're taking a vector and multiplying repeatedly by sigma square, right? Whereas in this operator, in this case, you're multiplying by a a transpose, a a transpose every time or a a adjoint. So like in this thing, you're going to do A adjoint times A, A adjoint times A, again and again and again. And that is equal to a power iteration. So what we do is we solve the Navier-Stokes in forward time from 0 to T with guess U0. In other words, we're taking this equation or a nonlinear version of this equation. We are starting from U0 and we are, you know, performing this operation till time T and actually solving for ut rather than getting e to the at or something. So from u0, I'm hitting it with the correct operator, whether it's linear or nonlinear, solving the entire Navier-Stokes or entire whatever, and getting the velocity field at time t. I've got the velocity field at time t with my guess u0. I don't know whether it's a, you know, good guess or bad guess for the property I'm trying to optimize. Then, at time equal to t, I start with the relevant adjoint equation. For each of these equations, I can derive an adjoint equation. And we'll be doing an example of that. In backward time from t to 0. And once I reach back 0, I can walk down the gradient for my next guess of u0. So the gradient also, which is the gradient to walk down in this process will only give me. And I keep repeating it until convergence where I've optimized the property that I want. So it's a power iteration, but in an operator. Okay, so like let's compare singular value decomposition to uh, direct adjoint looping. So like uh, uh, in the so this uh, this uh, example has been provided by Harshit. He's done a very nice job of you know showing how this whole thing works. So um, what he's done here is the following. 
So he has taken this example, okay, x1, x2, the whole dot is this simple matrix times x1, x2. It's exactly of the form that we've been talking about, a non-normal matrix where it has negative eigenvalues. So without any off-diagonal term, nothing will grow at all. But the off-diagonal term is bringing the non-normality and the interesting stuff here. So then he solved SVD and if, can you see the dotted line here? That dotted line is the SVD optimized up to time 0 0.6. So remember one thing that you know, every time we are optimizing something, we are only optimizing up to a given time t. At, at that given time t, we are deciding what we are optimizing. It could be the integral of the kinetic energy up to that time, or it could be the kinetic energy at that time and whatever it could be whatever but we it everything depends on that time remember like all those unitary matrices all those things are going to vary with time so uh, this dotted line is the you know best initial condition which will give this much gain one point something at time equal to 0 0.6 notice that there's another arbitrary initial condition he started with which is actually doing better at shorter times but so if we had optimized for shorter times, we'd have come closer to that one. So, but uh, this is the overall maximum at this time and whatever other examples you randomly choose, the energy will lie below that. So like you can perform SVD and you can get this curve. You can get similar curves for all times. And then you can draw an envelope over all times like this and you can get the biggest linear growth possible. So this thing, you can do the exact same thing for Navier-Stokes and in some situations you can get gain of a factor of 1000, uh, gain of several hundreds is very, very normal. Okay, now this example being the easiest one, we can actually plot the gain function for all x0, y0. Like we can say, I don't care if it's optimized or not. And we can plot the gain function up to this time t because I know what the answer is going to be at this time t just by solving it. And this is what the gain function looks like for this example. So like uh, it's basically, I think it's log that he's plotted here. So it's basically zero um, in this direction and maximum in that direction. So if I choose a ratio of x1 to x2, you know, which lies on this red dotted line, I'll be getting the maximum growth. So this, uh, I mean, I can get the answer from this uh, uh, complete solution, which I can never do for Navier-Stokes. So in this complete solution, you will see that there is a whole line which determines the optimal growth. And that is just because this whole system is linear. So I could multiply both of them by any factor, like two, three, whatever, and I'm going to get the exact same dynamics. So like uh, everywhere, I mean, that's why you get straight lines everywhere in this domain. Like you get uh, an S, uh, uh, a gain function, which is just linear in this because the system is linear. And uh, so like, suppose we wanted to do this, we've already done it by SVD, got this answer. Suppose we wanted to do it by uh, direct adjoint looping and that's what Harshit did here. So he started from some arbitrary initial condition and you can see that the gradients are always going from this minimal most hopeless growth line to the best growth line. So all gradients are pointing in that direction. So you can solve for those gradients also and linearized and you can get the gradients everywhere in the plane and then like you start with an initial condition and you do this direct adjoint looping you go forward uh, forward in the uh, direct equation and backward in time in the adjoint equation and you come back here at time equal to zero again and then you get from that solution the gradient you immediately get which way to walk. So the way to walk that the adjoint solver is telling you is the exact same way to walk that uh, the linear, so the gradient is also telling you. So you're pointing in the gradient direction and very soon, like within some seven, eight iterations, you're going to converge into this place. But that seven, eight iterations can sometimes be costly as we will see in the next example. So the next example is a non-linear one. So again, Harshit has picked a nice one, which 
really demonstrates the whole thing. So like, uh, uh, remember we talked about this minimal seed thing. What was the minimal seed? The minimal seed was the smallest. So we're calling this steady state turbulent and this steady state laminar, okay? And this is the basin boundary. So for this flow, everything can be calculated exactly. It's a toy model. So everything can be calculated exactly. So you could start from different, different initial conditions, X1, X2, and you can plot, you know, how those trajectories go in time. So these are how they go in time. So some bunch of them will come back and settle at the laminar. Some bunch of them will go and settle at the turbulent. They may do, you know, some complicated stuff, but they'll all come back and settle here. And similarly with the lamina, you can plot the entire phase space by solving it exactly. Um, Navier-Stokes, one simulation with one initial condition at a high Reynolds number can take months. So obviously we cannot explore all the initial conditions. The, um, the, di uh, the dimension of all the initial conditions is so very enormous. Each initial condition is an initial condition over all spaces prescribing points, uh, prescribing the velocity and temperature, whatever you may want at every point in space. So you can imagine that such a phase plot is basically impossible for uh, a turbulent flow or even a you know, flow where there's laminar and turbulent coexisting. It's completely impossible. But for this toy example, to get our thoughts straight, it's nice to view it pictorially, uh, which is why we've done this thing. So, like, what are we doing here? We've got this green line, which is the basin boundary. So, we know for a fact that anything starting on this uh, side will go to the laminar. Anything starting on that side will go to the turbulent thing. So, in some sense, it's a barrier. So, then uh, we want to ask, what is the smallest thing I can do to the laminar steady state to... Uh, you know, what is the smallest perturbation which will actually take me to the other side of the boundary? And if I draw concentric circles around the laminar steady state and see which circle first touches the green line and where it touches the green line, that will give me my minimal seed. So if this is my x1, y, x2, if I start, and this is x1 versus x2 in this plot, okay? So like, uh, if this is my x1, x2 at time equal to zero, or I start at teeny bit outside the green line at this place at uh, time equal to zero, I can be very sure that I'm in the turbulent part of the uh, basin boundary, uh, turbulent part of the yeah, base, turbulent side of the basin boundary. So this is the minimal seed. So how will I go about finding it with the direct adjoint looping? So that is going to be the question that we want to ask. And uh, remember that this minimal seed is not the edge state. The edge state corresponds to a saddle point, whereas the minimal seed corresponds to the smallest distance away from the laminar on the turbulent side. So then, uh, uh, so like if I start something slightly away, it will keep shadowing this, keep shadowing this thing for a very long time. So it might take quite a long time to reach it, depends on where I've started from. And then like it's going to spend a very long time in this neighborhood until it's somehow able to escape into this trajectory and then it will go fast to the turbulent. Similarly, if I started on the laminar side, same thing. It will go here and spend a lot of time in the near the edge state. So why am I focusing repeatedly on this spending a lot of time near the edge state thing? The reason for that is that when you spend a lot of time on the edge state, so imagine that turbulence is made up of many, 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 many saddle points all over the landscape it's made and remember this is an equilibrium point because x1 dot x2 dot is zero there are three equilibrium points in this nonlinear system where if i started exactly there am i actually at an equilibrium it's an unstable equilibrium in two directions and stable in two directions but it's an equilibrium point so the point is that you know if there are many 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 saddles in a turbulent domain like even here there are going to be many many saddle things like many trajectories with saddle points then turbulence is going to spend long time close to those saddles so it's going to spend a long time near various you know saddle points of various uh, 
manifolds. So like this gives me an idea that can I reduce the uh, complexity of turbulence? Can I understand the basic things about turbulence by looking only at a very few, I mean, I mean a far fewer, uh, uh, you know, uh, regions of state space. So if I understand all the edge points and all the time that turbulence spends around it, I may get a reduced image of what all turbulence can do and how turbulent dissipation works, how mixing works. I can get a much, much better idea of that by uh, uh, understanding this. So edge states, uh, this edge state is particularly important because of the lamina turbulent transition and how long it takes to reach there. Okay, I don't see questions, so I'm going to continue, but do feel free to stop me. You can even unmute yourself and ask questions. Or if you want me to go faster, slower, anything, you can give that feedback also. Okay, so this nonlinear example we're going to continue it to its completion so the idea behind that and why it's important for turbulence i've told you and we're going to do direct adjoint looping to see what we get out of this so like first we have to write down the constraints in any of these you know we're going to set it up as a lagrangian optimization setup and for that we have to define our constraints so first of all the two equations we started with here are constraints in other words, these two equations have to be satisfied at all times, uh, all the time. So these two are my constraints. F1 is this equal to zero and F2 is that equal to zero, which are the two uh, uh, constraints from the equations. We have further constraints from the initial conditions. So suppose I start with an X1 zero, which is my initial condition. Then the X1, the value of X1 at time equal to zero, should be equal to x10. This is a trivial constraint, but it's important because it helps us, you know, derive some things for the initial con initial and final times. So this is a trivial condition, but it needs to be satisfied. Similarly for x2. Now we construct a Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian looks like this. It has got a cost function. You can choose any cost function or gain function whatever you may want to call it. So Harshit insists that if it's uh, something you want to maximize, you call it a gain function. You want to minimize it, you call it a cost function. And we will define that as just the energy. So it's x transpose x divided by the, its value at, I should have given small x. I don't know why I gave capital X. So there are typos in this. Uh, divided by its value at time equal to zero. So that will be the thing that we want to optimize. How much can the energy grow given the initial energy, uh, scaled by the initial energy. And uh, these constraints are now in the standard way you uh, uh, derive these Lagrangian things. You put Lagrangian multipliers on each of the constraints, which are A1, A2, B1, and B2. And uh, the Lagrangian, Lagrange multipliers satisfy this thing. Like the, the, the thing is the, 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 um, triangle bracket gives you that is basically standing for the time average of the product and here they are scalars but uh, uh, I mean in Navier-Stokes they'll each be big vectors and so I mean extremely big vectors but yeah so uh, this is how we set up our Lagrangian and the idea is to optimize this Lagrangian as in usual optimization procedures so when I have an optimum then I know that that Lagrangian at the optimum with respect to any of these variables, xi or the initial condition, everything has to be zero. Like it has to be optimal, namely the derivative has to be zero. So that gives me all these conditions. In particular, it gives me these two equations in a1 dot and a2 dot. Remember, these were the Lagrange multipliers. And this is extremely important for the Navier-Stokes because these are like the equivalent of the adjoint Navier-Stokes equations. So given an equation, like it could be a viscosity varying flow, it could be a flow with some funny boundaries and funny thing, it could be a, a heated flow, a flow with more than one fluid with interfaces. For any of those systems, you can derive the relevant adjoint equation by following this procedure, just minimizing for this. 
So for this 2 by 2 system, these are the adjoint equations. You also get out of the, uh, this like uh, se several different things which have to go to 0. And because, you know, you're uh, perturbing by a functional, so it gives you, you know, some handle on how many things need to go to 0. And based on that, you can get the value of the adjoint quantity AI at capital time T. So, like given the x at capital time t, you can get the adjoint at capital time t. And you can get also these bi's which, which were the other Lagrange multipliers for the initial values. So, now this is very, very crucial because what you can do is you can start with these equations. Hmm, and, and you want to optimize something till capital time, cap, time capital T. So you just march on these equations, just integrate these equations by Range Kutta or your favorite method, march till time capital T. Add time capital T and you started with some guess value of, uh, guess initial value. So I could be starting somewhere here, but I actually want to reach there. So I start with this and I just march on that solution till capital time T. And I do that and then this procedure tells me how to correct myself to march in that direction. And that's what we are trying to do here. So then uh, I know the adjoint differential equations and I know the initial condition, the, the adjoint is going to march backward in time. So I uh, the initial condition for the adjoint is at the final time t. Adjoints are only well defined in backward time, especially in Navier-Stokes. The adjoint equation will come with whenever you get uh, mu times del square u, you will get a minus mu del square u. So if you did it in forward time, you will actually be doing uh, anti-diffusion. So like uh, adjoints are only well defined in negative time for the um, Navier-Stokes and all those physical systems. So then I start at capital T. I know what its value is because I've solved for x till capital T. So then I do that and I march these backwards in time till time equal to 0. Two things to note here. One is that the adjoint uh, satisfies a linear differential equation and this is true of Navier-Stokes as well. So like initially you think, yay, like linear equation that makes my life so very easy. But note, it contains all these x1s and x2s all of whom I know because I've marched from time equal to 0 till time equal to t and now I'm marching backwards. So I know all of them. But I need enormous storage to store each of them, you know, at every time instant. Uh, and, and so like this is an ordinary simple ODE but with enormous, uh, what do you call it, uh, um, uh, time varying coefficients. So this time varying coefficient thing I have to store at each time and this is actually a nightmare for Navier-Stokes. So like what people do is when they march up to time capital T, they don't store all of it. They repeatedly do small, small marches, small, small cycles to store only little, little portions so that the storage demand is low. So you do like all kinds of, um, you know, uh, difficult things to come back in time till time equal to zero. Now that you come back to zero and you've already, you know, taken care of these things, you have these additional conditions on the Lagrange, on the Lagrangian. So these additional constraints will give you how to march, how to do a better guess. So like suppose this was zero, then your guess xi zero is perfect. But when it's not zero, this guess is not good. And so like I, I know the right hand side of this, so I know the gradient, uh, the direction in which I should match my Lagrangian. So I know how to change my xi0. This is again in Navier-Stokes a huge exercise. Like it's not always easy. It's not always unique. I can't go into all that. There's a lot of extra drama for that. But uh, if you can find your way around it, you walk down gradient. Namely, you walk in the direction which makes the uh, this variation zero. But this is actually gradient ascent, not descent, because you're going towards a maximal value of j. So you're trying to maximize j, not minimize it. So then that equation has been solved back and forth, back and forth until convergence. And uh, so like what, uh, what Hashid did is to plot the uh, gain function j in space. 
So here again, we can solve the entire system. So he's plotted this gain uh, function or cost function j. And this was the laminar place where you remember. And this was the turbulent. And here you're going to get zero because your cost function at time t is, I mean, the, the thing is going to flop back into the laminar. So either you've given it enough time, but whatever, it's going to flop back to a very small value. And if you're starting very, very, very far away from there, your, your x0, y0 will be so big compared to this that you will not optimize it. So like you're not finding the minimal thing. So like you see that the gain is maximum, I mean locally maximum in these two places, one here, one here. So depending on where you start from, you can get unlucky and find something that's not quite the minimal seed. This is what I want to tell you. There's a lot of non-uniqueness in this game. So like then you can come and land up here, for example, if you started with that initial condition. But and because the gradient field looks like this, you can plot the entire gradient field and you can see that uh, uh, like Harshit, because he was smart, started here and in a few iterations, he's converged to the minimal seed by direct adjoint looping by walking down this gradient. So each time for each dot, he marched forward in time, backward in time, jumped on the gradient, forward, backward, jump on the gradient like that. So like given that this itself was so much hard work, uh, it's much harder work for Navier strokes, but I've already given you the idea that there is a lot more hard work to be done. But the exact same idea is used over there. Now, when he plotted this uh, trajectory, uh, yeah. Uh, just a question regarding that plot. Uh, did you look into what that minimal seed would be if it was a linearized version of that equation? Yeah, so like, uh, um, Unfortunately, he didn't plot the linear one of this exact same one, but you'll get a plot very much like this. So it will look quite different. That minimum Yeah, it will seen. only look like this. It won't care about the turbulence, about anything, right? And there's no thing concept of minimal seed because there's no basin boundary. There's nothing. You can only live around the laminar fixed point. Okay. So the whole idea in the minimal seed is fundamentally nonlinear. So he could have drawn a linear thing for the exact same one, but he'd have got like in the two eigenvalue directions, some line, that's all. So he would never have got, you know, a, a funny shaped object like this, which is zero everywhere and then suddenly jumps to a positive value and so on. Okay. So this is all because it's nonlinear. Okay, so now we talked about this, right? Like, so it's... We talked about this minimal seed. Now what he's done is he started two trajectories just on either side of it. And they are following this thing and reaching the edge state. And then one is going this way, one is going that way. So that's the trajectories we're going to see here. So in very short time, it came pretty close to the edge state. It came very close to the edge state. And then it lives very, very, very close to the edge state, like basically going nowhere for a very long time. And then this is a very slow process. And whereas this is a fast one where suddenly it goes towards, one goes towards what we call the turbulent attractor, the other goes towards the laminar attractor. And this thing is very fast. So the basic model is it's spending a lot of time near the edge state. Okay. Um, so we're now going to talk about this thing we're going to talk about the turbulence part of this in some detail and we will see like where stability becomes important in this game like if you're already turbulent then why should you care about the stability but we're going to look for periodic orbits their stability so the concept of instability is generalized now to these uh, kind of thing so already we've seen this uh, subcritical transition many times and this is a nice photo which uh, sketch which uh, Graham and Florian have given in this annual review paper. This paper is very, very worth reading, even if you're not in the field, just to get a basic idea of, you know, how people are trying to understand anything about turbulence, especially shear and wall bounded turbulence, how you can get anything out of this. It's a nice game. So, um, so here now he's drawn this, uh, what do you call the basin boundary? as a you know object like it's now like a plastic sheet which you know things here cannot cross 
so and on that plastic sheet you have this saddle point and on the basin boundary all trajectories are i mean not all trajectories some particular trajectories leave, leading towards that edge state and this he calls a relative equilibrium and uh, in the lower branch solution so basically it's like it's basically sitting here it's sitting here it's an unstable saddle point which is sitting there and he calls it a relative equilibrium because in turbulence they uh, you know move with the mean flow every time so if you have a periodic orbit it will be periodic for an observer who's moving with that uh, mean flow and uh, similarly an equilibrium point is also moving with the mean flow so that's basically what they call and uh, now uh, he's got this turbulent attractor earlier i drawn it as a dot and i said more on this later so this is like basically what i've been building up to and this is the concept i want to give in this lecture and if i can convey something about this i'll be very happy so even if you've not been listening till now like uh, you can start listening now and get some idea of what is this game of trying to understand turbulence and uh, so the way it goes is this so imagine now that you have uh, a channel x y z at every x every y every z you have a u so every point on this thing is actually uh, a big 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 n dimensional object which which tells about the u v w at every x y and z so it's a huge array of that u v's and w's uh, which represents one point on this turbulent attractor and uh, then like this thing is time so this is how it goes with time so at the next time instant it will go there 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 and there so it it executes continuous um, uh, you know orbits in time so that is like fundamentally a turbulent attractor why do we call it an attractor you see that there is this entire space of all possible x's y u's v's and w's at all x's y's and z's but they will obviously not satisfy the turbulent attractor like if you started a initial condition somewhere here it would quickly run to this attractor then it would live on this attractor forever so this attractor is a very very complicated huge dimensional thing but it's much smaller than the um, space it's embedded in if you can understand that it's a much smaller dimensional space than the space it's embedded in so it's like anything you uh, start with is going to run to this turbulent attractor so all the u's v's and w's for a particular geometry and a particular renolds this entire thing changes with geometry renolds you change one little thing and this entire thing changes but for that particular renolds particular this there is a turbulent attractor on which the dynamics always lives forever and ever and in the form of chaotic systems this is a strange attractor strange attractor means it doesn't have some integral dimensions it has fractal dimensions and uh, every point on this thing is unstable so like if if you put turbulence at one particular uvw it can never live on that uvw forever it will keep running away from there so every point on it contains like many unstable directions in its manifold so there are many saddle points periodic orbits everything in this place so it's going to be always very close to a saddle but not quite at a saddle it's going to be always very close to a periodic orbit but not quite at a periodic orbit in other words in uh, chaotic systems of this kind periodic orbits are dense in the attractor what that means is everywhere in the neighborhood of this strange attractor you will find a periodic orbit and the turbulence will shadow that periodic orbit for quite some time if there's a saddle point like if there's a heteroclinic orbit it will shadow that saddle manifold for quite some time and it could also contain like periodic orbits of zero i mean fixed points as well apart from periodic orbits so this is the kind of uh, thing that turbulence uh, can be described by on the other side of the Uh, laminar attractor and in some cases there may be no laminar attractor but still this will hold true so this is fairly general for shear turbulence it could be rayleigh bernard rayleigh taylor uh, what do you call it channel uh, pipe boundary layer it could be like jet wake anything anything 
and in the ocean also you'll see it in the atmosphere also you'll see it uh rama yeah can you please go back to the pre previous plot yeah this one oh the uh, the next one okay yeah so you said like so one can think of turbulence as like these collection of different saddle points in some way so like does that picture one can visualize here also in this phase space in some sense because this looks like just one uh, orbit which it's circling again and again they're not multiple saddle points so to say uh, in the turbulent regime yeah yeah that's a good question see the thing is like this is not a it's only a caricature okay yeah. There's going to be many, many, many of them. And Please. imagine what, like the turbulence will never live on a periodic orbit or on a relative equilibrium. Turbulence will live arbitrarily close to it. Uh -huh. But you're saying the dynamics would be, I mean, it would remain there for a longer period. Of yeah, it would look very similar to what the periodic orbit is showing. So let me put it this way. Suppose I solve Navier-Stokes and I get these periodic orbits. I could solve Navier-Stokes these uh, red things are actually perfect time periodic elaborately structured solutions of the navier stokes i see you get that and uh, like they may not they are not what turbulence will explore turbulence will explore very near them turbulence will never get stuck in a periodic orbit no, but it would remain there for a longer time yeah it will remain in the neighborhood for a long time so like it can, so what it will do is it will typically shadow one periodic orbit, then jump to another one, shadow that, then jump to another one, shadow that and so on. Yes. Okay. So you can imagine that all the time it's arbitrarily close to some periodic orbit and these jumps will be along heteroclinic orbits where it will jump from one kind of fixed point to another. It'll, these jumps are where it's jump running away from a saddle point. So things like that can happen. So it doesn't have to be close to one. And the, the this air place is dense with periodic orbits. So like it will be going on hopping between these. Right. Okay. And there is also some, uh, there is also clear indication that the number of periodic orbits, the complexity of those periodic orbits, everything increases like phenomenally with Reynolds number. So as you keep increasing Reynolds number, you can get into deeper and deeper trouble if you're trying to describe turbulence this way. So does this answer your question, Mukesh? Uh, part, yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, like it's not a very Rama, easy concept to get, like you need to live with it for a while to get it. Rama, uh, just sticking to this point, uh, this basin boundary, this is obviously a highly nonlinear uh, aspect. So I'm presuming that the underlying linear operator, whether it's normal or non-normal, uh, hmm. that won't really influence the basin boundary, right? Okay. The point is that the minimal seed is uh, influenced by the non-normality. Okay. The minimal seed like uh, will not be interesting in a normal system. You'll have to go to huge amplitude to reach turbulence. But like going back to the previous example that you were showing, mm. uh, where you had the minimal seed in the underlying, uh, because here, I mean, how do we uh, sense non-normality? Considering... Ah, so like, uh, I think Harshit did this exercise. He keeps increasing the the um, uh, Y term, the, um, uh, the non-normal term, uh, of diagonal term, and the M keeps going nearer and nearer to laminar. Okay. So like we seem to see this broad pattern where M will go closer to laminar, the more non-normal it gets. Okay. But just because the transient growth is so much and it might help to, you know, reach this place. So the transient growth is so much that non-linearity can pick up. So basically this is one place where it becomes important. Another place where it becomes important is in the self-sustaining process that we'll talk about for these periodic solutions and turbulent solutions. It's very, very important that the system is non-normal. Non Thirdly, you know, like I was drawing this uh, uh, simple analogy to answer Mukesh's question by saying that, you know, for a long time, it will tail the periodic orbit and all that. Because the thing is non-normal, even if this is uh, like a stable direction, it will run away from the stable direction. So it can do funny dynamics near the stable direction also. 
so lot of interesting things happen because this uh, operator is non normal even here so it's not just in the this regime that we care about it so you can define non normality around the turbulent attractor that's what you are uh okay let me put it this way uh around the turbulent attractor so if i'm trying to optimize for something let's say dissipation maximum or something like that the fact that the condition number of this operator is much much greater than 1 will mean that the uh, the um, uh, maximum growth direction will be very different from the eigen direction so everywhere the maximum growth direction will be very different from the eigen direction so if i'm forgetting about non normality the answer will be very wrong in other words no where should i depend on the eigen values like i'm doing something close to a saddle point i'm seeing two things going towards two things going away those are the eigen directions but this turbulent uh, operator is non normal so it need not obey them in the way that we believe and those may not stand for maximum dissipation or maximum anything so like if i want to increase mixing in those problems there's very interesting stuff which we can do by looking for minimal seeds looking for things this game is in its infancy for anything apart from plane channel flow or plane coet flow so there's lots of things to be studied <laughs> there is a question in the chat box from mm. uh, ramana uh, regarding the di- the question is regarding the direct adjoint looping mm. uh, how to choose an optimum time t for solving the navier stokes in forward time for a problem okay this is a very very good question ramana uh, basically the only way to do it is to try with different different capital t and see like how the dynamics changes so for the channel flow simulations that we did we saw that uh, if we are stopping at time t equal to 2 or something we get the wrong answer but if we go to like 10 then 10 and 15 give us similar optim optimals similar things which lead towards minimal seed and so on so yeah it's not an easy question to answer you have to do it at different times and see and you may sometimes want the answer at a particular time that's the only answer i can give you okay so let us now go to the next slide uh, rama sorry one fa- yes, final yes yes okay just to stay on this point so mm. then this is the time where the turbulent state has set in where the linear concepts don't stay right like mm. they don't hold so mm. all the non normality or the eigen value analysis they are the linear concept for a reason that they hold only for time periods which are small right and okay okay two talk- points two points one is that the uh, linear things work in near any of these periodic orbits or fixed points agreed you can linearize about those things and study that yeah yeah ah second thing is you may not be able to do a linear analysis but you can do a direct adjoint looping in any any place you like with any non linearity yes that and important. that direct adjoint looping will lead you to uh, optimals which are different from what you'll get from a eigen value analysis based on the property of operator itself uh, yeah yeah so the operator is a massively non linear operator but you can you know do this direct adjoint looping in the correct way and because the direct and adjoint are doing different things now they're not just you know like in the sigma square uh, when i was doing power iteration i was always multiplying by sigma square but now i'm going direct adjoint direct adjoint and each loop is one iteration one power iteration got it. yeah right and that i can do for a non linear system so my concept is there even in full turbulence yeah okay mm-hmm. okay so now this like we've been talking about edge state and the only edge state we saw was this you know little thing which uh, harshit made now let's look for a real edge state so a real edge state and uh, this is like published in 2016 and uh, um, you know i got this thing like thanks to the author the movie it's a very beautiful movie to see so it gives you an idea that uh, and this is an asymptotic suction boundary layer this is a big boundary layer 
and he's looking for what is an edge state like just on the other side going towards turbulence and he sees that this is a very very localized state which you can imagine right like you're trying to i mean it's it's actually you can't even imagine it but it so happens that all the time the edge state are localized states so like what you need to do is if you can go to this asymptotic suction boundary layer and in one teeny little you know corner of it if you can give streaks like this longitudinal streaks like this and some perturbations like this that will be your perfect edge state and you can give that and then let the thing run and see what happens so let's watch the movie first so for a long time it just does some simple laminar unsteady looking things because it's occupying the edge state for a long time that neighborhood so it's giving similar similar structures for a long time and now it's gone towards the turbulent state so this is a i mean you he's actually followed its manifold its unstable manifold from the edge state and found this these are not easy calculations but they're very rewarding because they tell you something about the physics if you come up with a good physics question you can answer them nicely with these dynamics okay uh, can i take 10 minutes more yes ma'am okay uh, so mm, so we have seen that turbulence is a chaotic attractor and each point on its curve stands for you know a, the whole set of uvw at every xyz so each point is a complete description of that time t and this arrow is time t and what you see is that most of the time it goes into some strange attractor like this i mean i've just uh, what do you call it um, Uh, schematically drawn it i don't know like i mean how to explain it in space but for a long time it will occupy things which look similar look similar look similar basically streaky structures with other things in it and then suddenly once in a while it will go to a big very different state it will do these rapid uh, forays into completely new territory so this is very typical of the turbulence attractor it does you know uh, business as usual business as usual business as usual and then this thing called a burst and then it comes back and business as usual and then burst so like once in a while you'll see this burst and these bursts are very important because like very large amounts of dissipation happens in these bursts so like if you understand this uh, trajectory and all very well and you can understand the signature where you know this thing is trying to go off towards a burst like you catch it here somewhere you can control so like you can design beautiful control strategies to minimize these minimize dissipation by just preventing bursts from happening so this is a new game that people are playing now where they trying to control you know otherwise you'll spend too much energy controlling the flow and that may not give you overall benefit so you want to do the minimal intervention in controlling the flow so this can you know if you understand the turbulence attractor and how it looks when it goes towards burst you can actually do this and people are successful in doing this for toy models not for turbulence yet okay so we talked about all these manifolds and also just to show you the thing like these pink things you can are periodic orbits and you know every time it approaches a saddle it's very slow then it's very fast when it leaves the saddle and you know you can get heteroclinic orbits which go from one equilibrium state to the other fast here and slow there these are heteroclinic orbits this guy and this guy and this is what's called a homoclinic orbit because it's leaving along a saddle but it's coming back to the same place so these kinds of things also have been found in uh, turbulence or you know high reynolds number chaos and then there are also these limit cycles where trajectories approach it like it's not like a periodic thing where if you started on it you're on it but you can never get on it if you weren't on it but in a limit cycle you can approach it and get on it at long time and uh, non normality does a lot like we discussed and sometimes it makes a system even run away from a so called stable manifold some there is a question in the chat box i believe yeah. the previous slide uh, are these from himanshu are mm. these bursts related to intermittency in turbulence yes these bursts are, are related to intermittency because these bursts uh, you know tend to be uh, uh, small scale and very sharp 
so they have some connection to intermittency although like i don't know whether it's fully classified or i doubt that it's fully classified because here you're talking about shear turbulence you're not talking about homogeneous isotropic turbulence so i think the bursts need further study that's my take on it okay so we discussed all this in answer to mukesh's question i described this thing in words and now i have just shown a schematic of it where there are periodic orbits of all kinds you know and then like uh, there are you know these uh, equilibrium points everywhere and all these equilibrium points have some you know n very large n of stable directions and very large m of unstable directions and as you keep increasing the renolds the m increases and n decreases so all of them become each of them gets more and more and more unstable as time goes on there's more and more types of these as renolds becomes bigger and yeah it becomes as complicated as you can imagine and uh, i wanted to talk about the self sustaining oscillations but i think i'm running out of time i have this much more to say like is that okay yes sir okay i'll just say that quickly and i wanted to talk about our research but i'll bunk that i'll talk only about this okay this is the famous wolf self sustaining process so he gave it in 1997 like 25 years ago um for stream wise independent solute vortices he made this model by which he took the navier stokes threw away everything in the x direction put some forcing in cases where it's needed not in coet flow and he found he started looking for time varying solutions which was cream wise independent because you could see that uh, transient growth is biggest for these cream wise streaks so he started asking are they important and can they become go into the non linear regime and do something good so you can prescribe for example a v which looks like a cosine thing so like uh, i could prescribe something like this v plug it in and see what w and u will satisfy this thing and uh, solve it in time so the u looks like this so you can imagine that every time you have stream wise vortices the wall fluid is slow uh, the far away fluid is fast so it pulls wall fluid upwards and far away fluid downwards so you get fast streaks here and slow streaks here relative to the um slow streaks here and fast streaks here relative to the uh, mean flow so you get these stream wise streaky structures which are either slower moving or faster moving and the fact that this uh, structure is there gives you inflection points in the velocity profile and what did i tell you about inflection points even if it's viscous you can bet your money that it's going to go unstable so like you cannot retain this these streaks cannot remain stream wise independent for long they start becoming wavy so they become unstable to things in that direction and they become wavy and he's got a nice equation for explaining how these wavy structures can break down and give rise again to the rolls so you have a self sustaining process which goes from here to here to this to this to back here so that's basically the self sustaining process so you get a completely non linear breakdown this whole process is slow and this process is fast like non linear breakdown and regeneration of vortices regeneration may be a bit slower but uh, breakdown is very fast so this thing has been repeatedly seen in the turbulence regime like you know people have seen this again and again and that's what i want to spend so this is the self sustaining process stream wise vortices give rise to stream wise streaks which go unstable because they're inflectional and then the non linear interaction regenerates these things so these are various examples of okay people have been looking for traveling wave simple periodic solutions in various flows and these are all examples of that everywhere you will see streaky structures you cannot run away from streaky structures that's the moral this is a famous traveling wave found in pipe flow like many years ago and then this is like a localized structure in pipe flow again streaky and this lives on the lower branch uh, lower branch and this lives on the upper branch this is like unstable and this is stable these two live there uh, periodic solutions and uh, this um uh, puff solution is actually a nearby turbulent nearby solution of the navier stokes which is again time periodic so it's not turbulent but it resembles a turbulent puff in a pipe 
so like from these structures simple structures with simple computations you are able to get you know basic features of turbulence that's what drives this area and there can be you know arguments you know for and against it incidentally you can never get a steady time uh, time invariant flow which is a stream wise streak without waviness but if you put a bit of waviness you can get a lot of them here is a dns snapshot and this stripe equilibrium with very few uh, you know very much much smaller computation than the dns so it tells you that these things have some features of real turbulence and uh, so this is one last example i want to show you where uh, you know people do this simulations in this thing called a minimal box they do it in a small dabba so that uh, and then they impose extra symmetry so it's easy to look for periodic solutions in a big turbulent or you know uh, chaotic uh, simulation you get these streaky structures but you're not able to get exact periodic orbits there so like in these four dabbas this guy um, tobias schneider has managed to show these four uh, uh, you know uh, sequence of four things which actually constitutes a periodic orbit and in one of these dabbas he actually computed the periodic orbit which represents a minimal cycle this is actually not published but he was kind enough to share it with me specially for this lecture so that's why i thought even if i'm over running i should show it it's in an inclined rayleigh bernard flow so this is you know how much heat is coming in i time versus the dissipation so he's just plotted that you'll see the limit cycle and you'll see how this periodic pattern emerges again and again and it's slowing down when it goes to that top and then it oops speeds up again so these are the kind of periodic structures that people look for in tiny minimal channels and guess what if it's a solution of the navier stokes in a minimal channel and it's periodic in all directions this thing is a solution of the navier stokes in a channel of any size so it's actually giving you some you know basic feature of that and while the actual turbulence or whatever he's computed it's a relay of 3344 which i don't think is fully turbulent uh, but there is an inclination which gives you know things running in the gravity direction so then like uh, you do see these structures and signatures of this kind of periodicity okay so what we think we know is the following from this there are some repeating organizational structures in turbulence streaks and rolls are important in that uh, the self sustaining mechanism makes these appear and reappear all the time uh, dissipation is often low in the organized part of the motion and so like only in these burst dissipation is high and so this is my take on that and uh, they have these are all these studies till now are relatively low renolds low relay low this low that and often in minimal channels so its relevance to high renolds number shear turbulence is a big question mark and there can be two uh, groups of thought in fact there are people who think this or this and there are people like me who think in between or i'm happy to accept either so like you know you have to give up this whole exercise because you're going to get a proliferation of these exact coherent states you're getting a huge proliferation in unstable directions so it's all hopeless if you're trying to uh, you know describe turbulence just give up right now so that's one way of looking at it and the other is don't ever give up because high renolds number turbulence may be different but it also shows lots of structure and organization and in pretty high renolds numbers people have been able to do this resolvent analysis which i could not talk about today and they could you know use resolvent analysis which is basically a linearized analysis based on this knowledge of subcritical so this is the other reason uh, other place where the fact that it's non normal comes in this resolvent analysis when you take the resolvent norm comes out very different from you know an eigen value so like you get the most uh, important structures by you know uh, you can reduce the uh, um production term that means the nonlinear term in the navier stokes to a few modes very nicely by resolvent analysis and it is able to explain a lot like dissipation and it can be used in things like control so this is basically what i wanted to say let me skip the other things i wanted to talk about and i showed this um, 
thing yesterday and i think i've covered some of that so like if people have questions i'm happy to answer them now or if it's too late like you can mail me or something thanks for your attention and thanks for the opportunity uh thank you rama uh are there any questions So uh, while we wait on some questions, I was so when you spoke about the Cyrenaols number shear turbulence and uh, extending it, is it that we are limited based on the computational ability, or are they, are they, is there something more that we don't know about it? I think it's both. There's a lot more that we don't know about it. For example, like you know, we found some periodic structures which. Visually look like turbulence, but uh, they can only be found in minimal channels because in minimal channel you're actually cutting down a lot of the unstable directions. So if you allow the unstable directions, these may never repeat. So you're finding these trick periodic, so I mean, finding these periodic solutions of Navier-Stokes, which are exact because they're exact solutions of the Navier-Stokes, but you're finding them by just trick by snipping off the unstable directions. So like uh, in turbulence, you have no idea like how many of these will be there and people believe that they're proliferating as you increase. And, and, and so the kinds of periodic structures, the kinds of saddle points, everything is going to become worse and worse and worse. That's the concept. But nobody can deny that however high like uh, turbulence has been, whether in atmospheric measurements or in uh, big, big simulations, which people are doing now, there is organization. Everywhere you see like powerful streaks, which are dominating the story. You see a lot of such things. You can't deny that there is organization. So like if you give up, you know, a nice method to understand them, I think you'll be... Uh, slightly sadly off but i can't say and just this uh, regarding uh, transient growth and non normality uh, has there been any other domain outside fluid mechanics where people have looked into it or uh, found relevance of it i think people are looking in several fields now like once in a while i come across a paper which mentions non normality in a completely different context okay but it's worth looking at it's definitely worth talking about and we should talk. Oh, thank you, Adele. She's uh, he or she is saying it was a cool talk. That's really nice place. Thank you. So uh, if there are questions, uh, no further questions, we'll close it here. Uh, the email address is already in the chat box. I'll paste it once again for those who join later. Uh, you could send your e uh, queries to this email and we'll uh, convey it to Rama and she will uh, respond to it. So thank you, Rama, once again for taking on the time. Uh, Thanks, we went from uh, very elementary fluid mechanics and ended in exact core and structures. That's quite a, a lot over two lectures. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.